Well, good morning, uh, where you are, and uh, we're welcome to Linwood Community Church. We're so glad you've joined us with this live stream. This is our first time doing this, and so you bear with us. With us, we know our production quality might not be the best, and we're working on that, and we want to do the best. And uh, with this uh, pandemic going on, well, we just want to make sure we're still uh, giving content and things. Now, this isn't necessarily a church service because. Well, we're not the ecclesia, and we're not assembled because we, we are the church. Our building's closed, but our church is going on. We would do want to encourage you. Uh, we're actually recording this on Saturday night, and you're watching this on the Lord's Day. And um, just wanted to give us some updates and announcements, as we often do at the beginning of our services here at Linwood. Our plan is that we'll be having this live stream for our main services, um, and we're actually going to do that twice at 9.30 and 11 on Sundays. And then during the week for small groups and things like that, we'll be using Zoom and be connecting with you. And then we're going to have some, some training things and some videos. And, and really, you, you know, um, God never wastes anything. We talked last week about how he's infinitely wise. And, and we've had plans to, maybe kind of a long runway plans to do some more technological things in our church. But this is really kind of just uh, jumping that up a lot. And we want to encourage you to kind of embrace that. And wouldn't it be so cool that with all the things going on, um, that during this time of not being able to gather, that um, we actually grow in connecting to people and sharing things. So I encourage you to do those things as well. So um, we're looking at what we're, what we're, how we're moving forward. And so hopefully this is an opportunity for us. So our family's here, and we're going to sing a couple songs. I'm going to remind you of some things, and um, we'll have a, a message here. And we just hope it's an encouragement to you, whether you're sitting on your couch right now, maybe driving around, maybe you're walking around, or just have this on your phone or your TV, and, um, and, and we're, we're encouraged. So I want to read a, a passage as our call to worship. And again, we just want to hopefully this be an encouragement and comfort to you. Isaiah chapter 40 says, Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And later on it says that there's this voice crying in the wilderness. And it says this, that say unto the people, behold your God. And I really hope that in the midst of everything that's going on and all the news that you're seeing, that you'll pause and have a biblical worldview. Look at God. Uh, God, the biblical worldview knows that there is uh, evil around us, that, there, that death is a real thing. But that Christ has conquered that. And so, while well, we want to be prudent and we want to be safe, we also want to look to the Lord and behold Him. So let's have a time of prayer, and then we'll jump into this first song. Father, would you help us now as we worship and we look to Jesus? We ask that you just bless this day, this Lord's Day. And I pray, thank you for all those that have joined in. I pray that you'd encourage them now. In Jesus' name.
those of you that are normally on our worship team, I just kind of happen to like these three up here. And I really like the one in the back there. And uh, we've had a busy day, but we're excited to be with you on this Lord's Day. Now, what's going to happen right now is uh, the kids and Jamie are going to remind us of a very, very important truth. And this is a truth that's found in John chapter 14 and verse 27, where Jesus prays a prayer. And he prays this for us. He prays this for us. He's praying this now. And he says this. And I want you to think about this as you have this anxiety. And there's another passage in the Bible that says to be anxious for nothing. But in all things, with prayer, let your request be known unto God. And so I want to ask you, have you thought about all the things going on and all the worries? Have you worried more or prayed more? And I know that's convicting when we can all pray more. But it's something I just want to encourage you to think that to have this anxiety but to pray. And so Jesus prays this. He says, peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And I hope you'll think this as they remind us to have peace. better gospel than me. 
And there's some truths in this book and this passage that we're going to look at today that I hope will really give you, and I think if you'll really pay attention to those words, will give you some stability in what's going on. And if you've never been to Linwood Community Church before and you're just hanging out here, you're just bored stiff and you thought, hey, I'll go uh, watch this guy at Linwood, um, I'm so glad you did, and I hope you're uh, I'm just going to pray. And uh, I've never, I've not done this before. I've never preached in an empty room other than those of you watching. So I'm just going to be real and transparent. I'm not going to pretend that anything. And you know what? I am not a disease expert. I am not someone who knows about uh, uh, all this crisis, everything. So I'm not going to pretend that. I'm not going to pretend to do that. I'm just going to preach the Bible. And hopefully that'll be a blessing to you as well. God, I ask you that you would help us now. Lord, I pray for the people that are out there watching and it. It can be awkward and weird to watch the service this way and, and so many distractions around us. And I pray that you would go through all of that and use your word. I pray that you would change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the midst of trials, there is a source of living hope. And so I want to read this passage for you in 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read verses um, 3 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 1. Why am I saying chapter 3? Chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And it says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through the faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Through you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not know, now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation your souls. This is God's inspired, powerful word. May God have his blessing to the reading of it. Well, I just want to get to the chase and just go to this passage really well and just and basically have a little bit of a Bible study time here. That a Christian's hope doesn't lose its fervency. That in the passing of time, a Christian's hope is much more glorious. You know, we, um, at the committal, at a graveside, I just did a funeral today, and that there is a, um, a phrase that we often read at a graveside that's from the Book of Common Prayer originally. And it ends by, by that famous phrase that you've heard. It says, you know, for as much as it's pleased God to receive this departed one, that we commit their ashes or their body to the ground. And then that famous phrase in the Book of Common Prayer, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And I love how this phrase in the Book of Common Prayer for that committal in the sure and certain hope of eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, we often talk about shore things, and we live on the Jersey Shore, and so everything's named after something about the shore. So I want to talk today about sure hope. Sure hope. It's a living hope that we have in the gospel. And really, this is, friends, the gospel is the basis of everything. The gospel is the basis of things in our lives. It's this, the, the gospel is, um, the, and what I want to point out today, we've talked about this idea of being gospel-centered, is that the gospel is the basis by which we endure trials and live in this current life. And so what... Peter is saying is he's giving us this theology, this exhortation to comfort believers that are going through things. He's, he's linking doctrine and practice. See, doctrine and practice, there's, they go together. There's not practical and then doctrinal. They're supposed to fit together. And in the midst of trials, 
in the midst of trial, someone's new birth, their salvation, the gospel, is the source of that sure hope, that living hope, living hope and a lifestyle of holiness in their lives. And so what Peter is doing, he has a theme in this passage, is that those who persevere in faith will suffer persecution, but they will be due, should have sure hope, because there's a certainty that comes in salvation. Now, just like the setting of this book, now we've been in the Gospel of Luke, and I'm really hoping to get back in the Gospel of Luke, but here in Peter, he's given in this context of this, there's alien culture, that they're alien stra- aliens and strangers in this pagan society. And that there's, the world doesn't understand this hope. I mean, you see the world around us. Is going, but the gospel gives us hope in trials. And Christians ought to be examples of that because we have this sure and confident, this living hope. And you say, well, what is this gospel hope? Well, I'm really glad you asked that. The gospel, the Bible tells us, is the good news that Jesus died and for our sins and that he was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a great passage to go to, that basic, classic definition of the gospel. I said, well, why do we need the gospel? Well, see, we're all born sinners. We're all sinners by birth and by choice. Now, everybody's talking about the coronavirus, right? And, 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 we, and we want to make sure that we're washing. In fact, I am worried that I'm not going to have fingerprints after this is over because I feel like I'm washing my hands all the time. Um, if you were here, you'd probably chuckle because that's a bad joke, but you're not. And so, um, and, but the uh, whole idea is that we, there's a virus going around that we want to try to not get inside of us. We want to, in fact, I saw one video, I thought it was really clever. You guys remember the Death Star on Star, Star Wars and how there was, this Death Star was so impregnable that, but there was the, that exhaust port that, you know, if Luke could fly his X-Wing in and shoot into that one spot, he could blow up the whole um, Death Star. And our body's a little bit like that. So if you wash your hands, because you know the germ's not going to go right through your skin, but it's going to come when you touch your face, your eyes, your mouth. And so we've got to be very careful, right? Because there's this thing outside of us trying to get inside of us to ruin us. But you know, there's something far worse in a spiritual realm than a virus like that. There's another virus that we have. It's a cancer. It's called sin. And we've all been born with it. And the problem with this one is it's not from the outside coming in, it's from the inside coming out. Because we're sinners in our heart. And Jesus even said it's not from that outside that defiles a person, but from, from inside, from our heart, that we're sinners. And the Bible says that all have sinned, and that includes me and that includes you. But Jesus is the hope that G, what G, how God did is he didn't just... The the vaccine that he had for this was sending his own son to become this virus, this sin for us, so that we could believe on Jesus. And if we would believe, repent of our sins, and call upon him, we could have that sure hope of having the gospel in our lives. Now, friend, you may be watching this for the first time, and you don't don't know Christ. And, And I just want to plead with you that God accepts all who will repent. You say, well, how do I know if I'm one that's allowed to repent? Do you want to repent? Then repent. I mean, he, whosoever will, you'll never will, and he's calling you to, to believe he wants that there's, uh, you know, um, it is a tragedy. It is a tragedy what we're going through right now as a country, as a world. It's a tragedy, the 11,000, uh, that last time I saw, of people that have died from this. But you know what's a, a, a greater tragedy, a greater loss, is the coronavirus only can, can cause the first death. But the Bible says there's a second death. And that's a spiritual death. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That the wage of sin is death. And that there is a death that comes that you uh, will face. That we're all, there's one, one of two places, heaven or hell. And if, you're not, if you've not believed on Christ, if you've not believed in I plead with you and beg of you to do so. And this would be a wonderful time to do that. To in your heart pray, God, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I receive that. I want to turn from my sin and give my life to you. And I invite you to do that. You don't have to wait till the end of this message. You can do that right now. You can hit pause, turn the thing off, and we'd love to hear from you. In fact, there's probably someone chatting right now that would love to talk to you. You just give us a call. We'd love to reach out in that way. But those that have this gospel and that give this life, the salvation that happens isn't just for heaven, it's for now. That this life we have in Christ and what Peter is pointing out 
is this. Now, I'm going to read a, a, a couple of quotes from you. This is from Warren Wearsby. He talks about this passage. He says that this confident hope, this sure hope, gives us the encouragement and the enablement that we need for daily living. It doesn't put us in a rocking chair where we complacently await the return of the Lord Jesus. Instead, it puts us in the marketplace, on the battlefield, where we keep on going when the burdens are heavy and the battles are hard. Hope is not a sedative. It is a shot of adrenaline, a blood transfusion. Like an anchor, our hope in Christ stabilizes us in the storms of life. But unlike an anchor, our hope moves us forward. It does not hold us back. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That's a wonderful thought that the living hope that a Christian has that you have if you're a believer isn't some, something that puts us in a rocking chair where we just sit around waiting on Jesus to come back. It's not something where, it, but it puts us on the battlefield, in the marketplace. It's not something to just give us a sedative, oh, I have hope, but it's an adrenaline, it's a blood transfusion. It's, not, it's, it's an anchor that we cling to, but it's not an anchor that holds us back. And so, Christian, you have hope. You have living hope. And this is your chance to be an example of that to all your loved ones. Um, to not just sit around like, oh, no. But you, yes, be prudent. Yes, be concerned. But, but show this hope. Now, the gospel gives us hope in this present life. I want to read a couple other um, statements. And this is from uh, a little booklet called The Gospel Primer for Christians. Um, and by Milton Vincent. And uh, I encourage you to get that book. I'm not making any money on it. I just, it's, it's a great little book that I think will help you think about the gospel in your present life. And he said this. He says, more than anything else I should ever do, the gospel enables me to embrace my tribulations and thereby position myself to gain full benefit from them. For the gospel is the one permanent circumstance of which I live and move. And every hardship in my life is allowed by God only because it serves his gospel purposes in me. I want you to think about that. The gospel enables us to embrace the tribulations we have going on right now. That the gospel is the one permanent circumstance. Our circumstances have changed a lot in the last couple weeks, haven't they? I mean, we made plans one day and they're obsolete by the time we can send the email about them, right? Things are constantly changing, but the one permanent circumstance is this gospel. And he goes, hope of eternal life with Christ in heaven also enables my heart to thrive during the most lengthy of trials here on earth. And when looking at the sheer weight of the unseen glories to come, my troubles seem light by comparison. When looking at the staggering length of eternity, my troubles seem fleeting by comparison. It is only against the backdrop of a glorious eternity that my circumstances can be seen in such a manner. And the promise of this glorious eternity is part and parcel of the gospel itself. I don't want to read that whole thing again, but I want to just think about that. When we look at the hope of eternity with Christ, that's going to enable our hearts to thrive during the most lengthy of stay-at-home quarantine times, during the most difficult trials, the stir craziness, maybe the depression that you're experiencing right now, that this eternity with Christ in heaven, this gospel sure hope will allow you to go. So our, our, our new birth gives us hope. And I just want to give you a few reasons from this passage here in 1 Peter. The first is the gospel. This gospel gives us sure hope in the midst of trials like we're going through right now. First, because of the nature of our inheritance. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living or a sure hope, a live hope through the resurrection to an inheritance that is imperishable. Or maybe you learned that incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading. Reserved or kept in heaven for you. Nothing's going to, Maybe you had some money that was stored up and was going to be an inheritance for your kids. And the last two months it's gone, right? There's one that will never be taken away. There's one that will never go. So you can have sure hope because of the nature of your inheritance in the gospel. 
It's incorruptible. It's undefiled. It's imperishable. It's immoral. It doesn't fade away. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't go down with the market. And it's reserved in heaven for you. We are included. Think about this inheritance that you have in Christ. You, Christian, are included in the last will and testament of Jesus. You're in his will. And that inheritance is never going anywhere. It's an incredible thought, isn't it? Praise the Lord. So that's one reason that the gospel gives us sure hope. Secondly, we'll go to verse 5 now. Because it's kept in glory. So it says there in verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You're being kept or guarded. You're being kept. This is an encouragement to know that you're being guarded for glory. Now, the glorification of a Christian is in Romans 8, 30, that is, we've already been glorified in a positional sense. But then we await that in a practical sense. So the assurance of heaven is something that is a great help to us today. Um, so the assurance of heaven is a great help for us today. And someone said it this way, who can mind the journey when the road leads home? So if suffering today means glory tomorrow, then suffering becomes a blessing for us. And some of you, we're all going through this, but some of you are really struggling right now at home with this quarantine, with stay at home with mandates. We say that this, the assurance of heaven would give us hope for today. That this suffering means there's a way, there's glory yet to come. That it is better than this. This isn't the best. Your best life is not now. Is yet to come. And you can endure troubles when we think about that way, the hope of heaven, right? So, um, I don't think I've told you this, and I'm probably going to get in trouble for doing this, and depending on how this is shared around the internet. But um, the day Jamie and I got married, our wedding day, uh, August 7th, 2004, um, a lot of crazy, a lot of weddings happen and have crazy things happen to that. I, I know there's been so many, maybe even someone's watching this right now and you were going to get married this week and, or had a plan for next week and you've heard news that these things are being canceled and I've heard of, um, had a pastor friend that uh, um, the, the wedding was planned for today actually and he ended up having to just go to their home to do the wedding and, um, and it's crazy, but a lot of things happened the day Jamie and I got married. Um, to, to start it off, um, I went to where the reception was to park my car and came back and um, forgot the ring. So I went back to, to get uh, the rings and then got caught in traffic. It was on a, a weekend in August near the Jersey Shore, up near Tom's River. And um, I'll just cut to the chase. I, I was literally late for my own wedding. It was a terrible thing. Uh, everybody laughs about it. I still get teased about it. And so whenever, whenever I perform a wedding and I just tell the groom, listen, man, if you can show up on time, you're doing a lot better than I could. And so, um, uh, but to top of all that, at the rehearsal dinner, uh, when we were doing the, we had the hardest time getting our, our license, the marriage license, because the person that was the witness wasn't there when we got it. And then I locked my keys in my car at the, re at the rehearsal dinner, had to call someone. Just a lot of things happened. And then, you know, we, um, uh, it was hot and stuff with the wedding, all these, it was just so no many things I'll go into it. It's, it's late for me, early for you, and I'm not thinking of it now. But you know what? I remember thinking that whole day, whatever happens today, at the end of the day, I'm married, right? And that was kind of my hope through that whole terrible day. And I was like, no matter, so no matter what you're going through, it's not, this is a temporal thing that God has at the end of the day, at the end of life, you're in heaven. And, and so when, the, when you know where the journey is leading, it gives a lot of assurance for where it's going right now, right? And so for, let's move on to verse six. It says, in this you rejoice, though, I want you to get this. Look at verse six. I mean, I, mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, stop right now, wherever you're at, whether you're, not if you're driving, but like if, if you're in your couch or something, I want you to look at this, this hope, sure hope in trials. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. I want you to get that. 
So you should have a sure hope because of the nature of your inheritance. You should have a sure hope, secondly, because we are kept for glory. We, we, and we should have a third, a, a sure hope because we are being prepared for glory. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been through grievous trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, be found more found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he, I want you to get this. Those of you that are going through trials, I want you to get this statement. God never wastes suffering. God never wastes suffering. He says, you rejoice in this, though, and he says, here's the trials, here's the truth. Now for a little while, There's a certain period of time that this trial is going to end. We're going to look back one day and say, what's two weeks? What's a month? What's two months? Um, when you're in it, it seems like eternity, right? Um, maybe you're with your kids at home during the day, and man, it seems like two days seems like the, a month trying to home, doing school at home and things like this. He says, for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. That God, if he needs to use them, he uses them for a purpose. But he never wastes suffering. Now, we don't assign blame. We don't understand why. We talked about that last week. And we learned that from the book of Job. But we know that God has a plan and a purpose. And he never wastes. He is sovereign. And he is infinitely wise. And he is good. He is always only good. And so we're being prepared for We need to keep this in mind. That all of God's plans that he performs is to prepare us for what he has for us in heaven. He's preparing us for the life and the service that we have yet to come in this, in this age and in the age to come. So life today is a school in which God trains us for future ministry and for future ministry in eternity. Because what we're going to do is we're going to worship Jesus, as the text told us. And God's tool for preparing us for glory according to this passage, is often trials. Trials are often God's number one tool for preparing us for glory. Um, God explains some facts about trials and general problems that Christians face when they're surrounded by unbelievers. And so he says, if need be, you're in heaviness. Trials are controlled by God for a season, as the authorized says there, for a little while. And you can, that's illustrated by the work of like a goldsmith. A goldsmith who a goldsmith would deliberately, in verse 7 there, would, uh, waste the, would deliberately waste the precious metal. Uh, he would put it in the furnace long enough to remove all the cheap impurities. And God does the same. He is the perfect goldsmith who's putting us through the test, through the fire, the perfect amount of time to burn off all the dross, to get the impurities out. And so... How do you pray when you're going through a trial? You know what we often do? God, get me out of this. Get, get me out of this. But you know what? He might say, hey, I bet you in this fire to burn some stuff off. And maybe God's doing that some stuff in your life. Maybe God has put you stuck at home on the couch right now to burn some impurities out in your life, in my life. Maybe some things, maybe there's some conversations that some families need to have and some husbands and wives need to have together and some communication that you've just been ignoring that for a while. Well, guess what? Now's the time. Oh, we don't have time to talk about it. Now you do. And God, maybe God's put you there for that time in this way. Let me give you one other thing, verses 8 and 9. Not only is God, we have this sure hope because God's using these trials, in these trials to prepare us for glory. But then we can have a little bit about that, of that glory right now. Verse 8 and 9, it says this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you don't know how, not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so you can experience that. To love Christ. To love Christ, you can experience that right now. Our love for Him is not based on physical sight. Because we've not seen Him. And we can rejoice in Christ as well. Each experience of trials helps us to learn something new. Every time we experience a trial, we learn something new and wonderful about our Savior. Often, oh, maybe you've been wronged. 
He was wrong. You can learn something about how he bore that on the cross. Maybe you've lost a child. God knows that he's given his only begotten son for you. That whatever it is, every trial we have teaches us something more about our salvation. Abraham discovered new truths about God on the mountain when he offered up his son. That God would provide himself a lamb. The three Hebrew children discovered God's nearness to them when they were put in the fiery trial. In the fiery furnace in Daniel 3, they learned about God's nearness to them. That was some one, a fourth, as they looked and said that there's a fourth there as the Son of God, like a Son of God. And Paul learned, when Paul went through deep trials with this thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, you know, and he learned something about God, that God's grace was sufficient. So there's three examples of how God uses a trial, a hardship, to teach us something about God. Abraham, three Hebrew children, Paul. And then in the end, we enjoy this because we receive this from Christ. The passage there in verse 9 ends with you are receiving the end of your salvation. The gospel applies to real life right now in these trials. Spurgeon said it this way. He said, a little faith will take your soul to heaven. But a great faith will bring heaven to your soul. So it's not as enough that we long for heaven during times of suffering. Anybody can do that. But Christians should respond in faith in trials. Faith turns this doctrine into practice. Faith acts um, on the content of our, the theology that we know and puts it in our heart. Faith and this theological security come together. And all of our worship is a response to these truths. So what Peter urges his readers to do was to exercise love and faith and rejoicing so that they might experience some of the glory of heaven in the midst of suffering now. And so I just want to leave you with this. Do you have a sure hope? Do you have a confident expectation right now? Do you have uh, what we would say this sure and certain hope? And Peter here says that that is found in this inheritance we have in Christ. Being born again to a living hope. Have you been born again? You've been born again to this living hope. So two people here. Either you need to be born again. What's it mean to be born again? It means to repent of your sins and believe on Jesus. I mean, you realize you're a sinner, you can't save yourself, and that you call on Christ to save you, and he will. Or you're someone who has believed on Christ. You know you're a Christian, but there's not much hope going on. But you need to recognize what we see in this passage, that your inheritance in Christ gives you this living hope for right now, while you're in quarantine. A living hope that's sure. And by God's grace, we can live this week with a sure hope. I want to thank you for joining us with this time. I want to close in prayer. I hope you have a blessed week. Father, thank you so much for this time. Lord, I pray for those that are out there right now listening, watching this. I pray that you'd bless them this week. I pray that you'd help us to reach out to our loved ones. And I hope most of all, God, that you would draw us to Jesus and help us to be rooted in this truth that the gospel gives us a sure and confident hope. And we thank you for this reminder. We thank you for this word. And we ask that you would use it in our lives now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. God bless.